Hey, I want to continue on. We've been talking for a few weeks now. We were away last week. Before that, we've been we've talking about the uh, uh, hearing the voice of God, and we've been talking about uh, ten uh, possible reasons why you may be struggling to hear the voice of God. The first week we went through the first three reasons. Uh, two weeks ago we covered the next four reasons. No, we were away last week. Today I want to uh, pick up from there and jump back into that. So I want to talk about uh, reason number eight. Why you may be struggling to hear the voice of God. If you haven't caught the first few, you can go back on YouTube and catch up and have a look. Have a look. But I also want to offer what I'm sharing this morning too to you as somewhat of a, what, a, what I believe anyway to be safe to prophetic for some people in this room. Um, I came in here yesterday. I'd, I'd had a, a crazy, crazy week uh, this week. Anyone had a crazy week this week? Wants to say. We've had a very, very crazy week this week. And so I came so in I, yesterday, Saturday. Saturday. Normally I'd try not to work on Saturdays, but Saturday was the Saturday. only day I had to sit had to, um, and to just and sort of sit with God sit and with the Bible and, and go over some notes. And I got in and here and all of a sudden I had this flood of thoughts and they wouldn't leave me. And I was, uh, was home last night and I didn't, don't, don't think I slept last slept because I just had this just flood of thoughts and I couldn't stop couldn't them. So I got up this morning, come in, come in. Well, you know, make those thoughts down and they fit in line with what I've been talking about. But I don't want to just don't offer them to you this morning as point eight point to, to eight. what we've been talking about. I want to submit this to some of you because I believe this is a prophetic word for some people in this room this morning as well. As well. So having said that, I just want to just, let's just close our eyes. I just want to pray for us this morning. Lord, thank you for your word. God, thank you for your presence, God, in this place right now. Father, you are with us. Sometimes we feel it, sometimes we just simply know it by faith, but it doesn't make a difference whether we feel or don't. Faith trumps feelings, God, and you're here in this place. And I pray now, Lord, just as, as we look at your word, God, I need just to, to get out what's on my heart this morning. And I pray, God, would you give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit holds to say to each one of us in this room. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, so. Carrying on with our points, point number eight, why you may be struggling, possible reasons why you may be struggling to hear the voice of God. Number eight, we're listening for another rule, not a dangerous relationship. We're listening for another rule, and we're not listening for a deeper relationship with our God. Luke chapter 11, verse 1 to 2. It says that one day Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach Lord, us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples. And Jesus said to them, when you pray, say this. And what's the very first thing he first said when he taught them how to put them there? Father. Matthew has the same story in there. Only Matthew doesn't record that, it was, that in, the teaching was in response to Jesus' disciples asking the question. But he's got the same teaching in there, and he starts, starts. Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. Like this. Our Father, our Father. We have a Father in heaven. We have a Father in heaven. We have a, we have a in heaven. When I say that word, many of us have many pictures and ideas, obviously, of what that means. Because many of us had fathers who disappointed us. Some fathers let us down consistently. To the point where, if you can name some of the character traits, we would say words to them. They are they are a disappointing point. They're inconsistent. They're, their actions don't match their words. Some of us were disappointed. Some of us have been hurt. Some of us were hurt unintentionally by fathers. I had many many moments in my growing up where my father unintentionally hurt me. My dad was a great man, still is an instant man, but not very connected to connect feelings. Not very connected to his emotions. Most doesn't really realise sometimes that he causes with the things that he says or actions that he does. Or the things that or the things that do, or the birthdays that they says, or the anniversaries he forgets, or Christmas, and all those blow occasions, and, and, and you never hear from him. And he's a good man. I love my dad, but he doesn't realise that sometimes he unintentionally hurt. Intentional fathers intentionally hurt, don't they? don't they? Some of us have had fathers who intentionally hurt us. I've I've, I've sat with people and heard stories of how, how 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 they were treated by their father. I've got one friend of mine, and he is that he would come home from school, and at the time he would sit and eat dinner, and his father and he sit across the table. He said his father is just eyeballing him, stare at him. Would not take his eyes off him with a frown and a frown face. And he would not move, move from that spot at the table until he saw his son shrink and die inside and cry away from the table, almost in tears, in tears, sit in his room and cry. That was the way that was father related to him. So when we think of the word, think of the word, we have so many different ideas, ideas, questions. 
But here's the thing. My mother is not the model of a father. God is the perfect model of a father. God is the perfect model of a father. For those of us that weren't fathered well, that maybe didn't have great models of father, didn't see great fathers, sometimes what we do is we, the starting point is our earthly father and then we do God based on that. What we need to understand is that Jesus wanted this what was to understand very early on. You know, don't do it that way. It's the other way around. God is the perfect father and you can judge. You can judge earthly father if you want in light of that. He'll never be that good. Earthly fathers will always make always mistakes. But please don't think that the earthly experience you have is the perfection of fatherhood. It's not. Perfection of fatherhood is your father in heaven. God, look at how he treats you. He knows the numbers of hairs on your head. He catches the tears that fall from your eyes. He watches you when you sleep. He snows when you're hurting. Get away from him. He loves you so much. He follows you around like a bad smell. Because he just loves to be loves to you. He just loves to look upon you. He loves to listen to you. He loves to be with you. Here's my question. Here's my, are you predominantly predominant listening for the voice of a divine, ta- divine master telling you to go and to go? Or are you listening for the whistling of a loving father calling you to come you to be? I think some of us miss the voice of the voice. Some of us fail to hear and discern the voice of God because we're thinking of God as a tart, as a master, and we're listening only for things to do. God, what do you want me to do? What's the next order, Captain? And we miss the intimacy. Jesus tried to introduce the disciples. He said, when you go and pray, first thing I want you to know is you're praying to your father. To your father. You're praying to a father. There's an interesting uh, 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 passage, uh, uh, experience that Jesus had with his father. And, and as a son, I read this passage and I think as a child, a child you know what, that's, that's, that's what I would have I loved. And I never got that. And maybe, maybe you would love this too when I read it out to you. It's you. You've read it a thousand times, but maybe you've never, you've never the personal connection. But each of us would love to have had this as being a part of our testimony. Yet this is what our Father in heaven does for his children down here. Remember when Jesus was baptized at the time of Jordan, he went and, 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 and you know, John goes, dude, you're the son of God. You've got to baptize me. Jesus said, no, 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 no. Do this the right way. You baptize me. And so John baptizes Jesus. And when he comes up, a voice from heaven, Matthew 3, 17, and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Think about that moment. I want you to imagine that you're in that air. And as you come out of the water, God from heaven, he's not ashamed of you. So he declares and screams out screams for everyone in the room. Hey, I want you all to look. to See that guy? That's that kid. And I love my kid. And I want all of you to know it. And don't you forget it. That kid's special to me. I love that. I love that. I would have loved my father to have that, have that, to feel like he had that public adoration for who I was. But I never got to accept that. Again, my dad was a good man. A good, please don't, don't think that my dad was a bad man. My dad is a great man with a great heart. heart. But he doesn't know God. God. And so he just lives out of what he does and he does the best he can with the knowledge that he has like all of us parents do. Mothers do. Mothers in this room, you cut yourself some slack. You fall short. I'll guarantee you're not perfect. And I'll guarantee you want to beat yourself up sometimes. And sometimes, some husbands, you might want to beat up your wife because your wife is a bad mum. My wife I might want to beat on the husband because you're a bad, bad. We're all bad. We're not perfect. There's only one good. That's God. Cut yourself some slack. Have some grace. We're doing the best we can, people. Can. Amen? We do the best we, do we can. We do the best we can. But God, but just do the best he can. He does the best. He does the best. He doesn't get it. Doesn't get it. He never makes a mistake. God hears me say something and doesn't, doesn't earn through the words and look into the heart and into the heart. exactly where I'm coming from. That's why I can be brutally honest with God. I'm brutally honest with my father. And my father. I don't mind smiling down with God and actually saying to God, God, God today has sucked. I've hate. went to church today and it was just terrible, terrible. Feel like now, feel like listens to you. I want to be singing again, Daniel. Again, got such a good voice. Why can't I sing like Daniel? I want a car like Owen. Oh, God, every time I go to church, I'm reminded of my car. My few years too old. I want that car. Why can't I have a grandmother like Liz? Like Leslie brings me coffee every coffee morning on a Sunday. My wife doesn't bring me coffee. Yeah? <laughs> but she does. She beats you to the punch. She puts up early and gives me one before we come here. Just to clarify, I've got a good wife too, people. I did. Thank you, Peter. Thanks for your prayers. Keep praying. I've got to go home yet. yet. Um, but God is a good God. He's a good, amen? He's a good God. He's a father. 
And when we're listening to God, we're listening to the voice of a loving, love, caring, compassionate, gracious Father who wants to speak to us. What fascinates me about this moment is, I don't know if any of you have ever read the books. Have any of you ever read the books where apparently, now apparently, now Jesus, when he was about 12, went to school one day and a sparrow died. Anyone read the read the? And so Jesus, the, all the boys in the playground picked up the sparrow and said, he thinks he's the son of God. Let's go and see what he can do about it. So they ran up to Jesus and said, what does Jesus do with this, Jesus? And Jesus went, he went, bing, up, up, the sparrow and flew away. Anyone ever, anyone that stuff? There are some ancient writings that kind of refer to the fact that Jesus did miracles, miracles, a school kid and all this stuff. Now we don't know any no stuff. Nothing has been recorded, recorded, collection of ancient documents that the Holy Spirit Holy put together and, and made, made 2,000 years later we still had, they'll have. To my knowledge, Jesus had Jesus, nothing miraculous or wonderful up to the point. Maybe he'd made a couple of chuppers in a table. Whoopee. We don't know what he had done. done. As a matter of fact, we don't even completely know. He was a carpenter because the word in the Greek there Greek could also mean stonemason. Could also mean stone. So we don't, we don't quite exactly know what he did. But we, we, we'll, we'll call him a carpenter because that's what the best translations say. The point of the matter is here, when, when the father when the stands up and says, this is my beloved son, I'm well pleased, he has not performed a miracle. He has not cured a leper. leper. He has not broken bread and fed in thousands. He has not walked on water. He has not calmed a storm. He has not gone toe-to-toe with the Pharisees and once. And he's done nothing other than just, just who he is. And the father looked at him and said, I love this kid. He's awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. He's awesome. I don't care. He hasn't performed for me yet. He's awesome and I love him because I'm his father. father. I'm not his divine taskmaster. I'm not the one in heaven that wants to listen for every instruction and all and only and miss the joy of being intimate and having a relationship with God. Having a relationship with God. It's part of the gospel, which we call good news, is that because of the cross, we get to be with God again. again. Not just do things for God again. We get to be with him. How many of you know that you go to the Garden of Eden and what did God say? God said, Adam and he said, here's the garden, tend and after and so on. Is that right? But before he ever gave them a task to do, he was with them. He was with them. And God, did, and God wants to be with you. Amen? Amen? God wants to be with you. He wants you to be with him. He wants you to have a relationship with you know, I've been running around uh, in my brain in the last sort of couple of, 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 of months with some thoughts and things that I just things that feel like, you know, every now and then I feel like that just speaks to me at these absurd abs- moments when I'm not even wanting to hear from him. Hear from drop something in, and I'm trickly trying to really find something to write things down so I don't forget don't forget things. But I've been thinking about thinking, uh, all these leadership conferences and stuff that I stuff do as a pastor. I go to all these leadership conferences, conference, and, and, and what I feel like is feeling is that we're getting to a point in the Western church where we're being taught more and more as pastors and leaders. We're more being taught how to be CEOs, companies, as opposed to intimate pastors who care for sick. I go along, I go, I can sit for three days and be taught all the principles of this and that. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. There's a business side of the church, yes. But yes, get taught all these principles of leadership. Lead, but my heart is crying out, saying, out, somebody help me get more intimate with the principles that saved me. Once somebody spend a session and tell me, tell me, I need to get on my knees and be with him. Or him. Right? In Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus called the disciples, he said, he said follow me. Make you fishers of men. Come follow me, and I'll do the making. Your part, you just follow me. I don't want you. To, I don't want to make yourself into something. I don't want you to. I want you around doing things for me, like I'm some like I'm kind of boss, I, I, and you're my servant. My, I want you to just come follow me. Let me here. I am. Be there. Come walk with me. Walk with you. Will commit to doing that. If you will come and follow me and be with me, I'm going to make you into something. Christianity is not a sin, not a management plan, behavioral management plan. Here's all the rules and the rules. Now you've got to stop doing this, stop doing that, don't do that, stay away, start all this. And, and sometimes you can, you can be in church or read Christian literature or listen to Pontus and you can literally think that's what the primary the thing is here. It's about behavior management. Let's all be better. Let's all be, let's all be good. Then when we find when we find it's not really good, we think, oh. Let me tell you something. Abraham wasn't really, really, really people. Read your Bible. Moses wasn't really, 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 really time. Read your Bible. Paul wasn't always really, really, really. Peter wasn't always really, really good. The disciples weren't always really, really good. But they wanted to be with to be. They wanted to be with Jesus. And we need to get back to the simplicity of wanting to be with Jesus, because it's the only way that you are personally going to be transformed and changed. 
And it's the only way that as a congregation we get formed in church. People want to see revival. We want to see God come and we want to see God do God all these great things. But God wants to come to his children, not just his sisters. God wants to come and be with his children. If I have a choice between going and going, when I was a manager at Dan Murphy's, give me a give me between going and hanging out with my kids with my, and, and my family, doing something with those with them, with or necessarily going going having to, to spend time with work colleagues and all colleagues. I, I think most of us would go. Look, I really enjoy, really family. I like being I like my family. I want to go spend time with my kids. I reshuffle. I used to shuffle to shy uh, shifts around just so I could go and I could go to sporting events and things like that to be there to turn up at rugby league games in my damn Murphy damn the form and that was my lunch break. I'd watch it and then run and then because I just want you just want to be with them, don't you? Don't you? you just want to be with your family. You just want to be with your kids. See the heart. See the gospel is that because of the cross we get to be with God again and not just do things for Him, not do things for God. And here's the reality: that's really that transformation and change takes place. Change takes place when we get in the presence of God. Change takes place when we be with him. Like Jesus like said, follow me, be near me, come with me, and I'm going to make you to something. I'm going to change you because you could change yourself. It doesn't absolve you from making right choices. It does not absolve you of making good decisions. It does not absolve you from having the intestine fortitude to say no to things. It does not absolve you from that. But the core foundational ingredient on true change and transformation is being in the presence of God. God. And allowing the strength of God and the Holy Spirit to work on us and point us in the directions of change that need to take place. You know, sometimes we, we think we think I need to change here. And God's going, you know what? You're banging your head against a brick wall because you can't because you can't change there until you've changed here. I've shared the story before. Some years ago, I bought a foosball table for my kids. You know, kids, soccer table thing. Many years ago, I bought one of those things for things for the kids. And we were living in Ballina and Ballina. Uh, on Christmas morning. They got the they got the table, unwrapped it, loved the foosball. The food. And of course, kids being kids, they want you to put want everything together on Christmas morning. They want to let you finish unwrapping presents. So, so buy things that don't have to go together. It saves you so much time on Christmas Day, people. Anyway, straight downstairs into the garage, we start putting this foosball table together. I rip, I rip it open. I get the box. I cut open the cut. So I put a picture of the table, table up against the wall there, so I know exactly what it should look like at the end. And then I pull them parts out. Jackie, the wacky one, hands me the instruction thing. Goes, oh, you can go need this. I, I look at the instruction. instruction I look at the picture. God, I need that. I'm a man. I'm a kid. Steal it off the picture. I just said no, thanks. And I just looked at the picture. The... And I get all the bits and pieces, and I start putting them together. And this goes, and this, and that goes there. And then I, and to this point, I'm almost done. I've got three pieces of wood left. And I've got a piece of wood. I'm trying to get it into this spot. It go in there. And I'm bending, bending, jamming, and thinking, I'm going to break this. I won't. This. I'm getting frustrated. And of course, the voice of wisdom speaks through my wife. My spirit says, why don't you try the manual? I grab the manual and have a look. And all of a sudden, I realize, rats, I'm in a, I'm in a dilemma here. Because I flick through, flipping the piece that I've got to go with to here I am up to, there's two, I think there was 67, 77 steps in this thing. The pick that I had to go in was step three. So I had to pull the whole thing apart all the way back way to step three and then and follow the process. And we can be like that sometimes. We don't realize that, you know, you can't do step four until step you've done step three. And you can't, you can't step seven until you've done step six. six. Yet we look at our own lives and go, I've got to fix it and, and, and do that. But you know what? We you know, struggle and we bang our heads against the brick wall, brick, trying to make ourselves perfect and really good. Really good. God's saying, cut yourself slack. I'm not ready to go there yet. I'm going here. Going here. And then we can be just as cruel as, or as naive with each other and go, and I'm looking at your life and I know exactly what you need to fix in your life. I know exactly where I've seen you and observed. You need to fix this. And the Holy Spirit's going, shut up, you're not me. You don't, his heart, you can't see what's really going really on. He can't deal with that because I'm talking to him about this over here. here. The Father, he wants to, he wants to us. Transformation begins by being in the presence of God, making the presence of God a part of it. Hey, you want joy in your joy? Doesn't the Bible say in His presence, the presence of what? Fullness of joy. Where is fullness of joy found? It's found in its presence. Well, you can go home, get up, dumb and dumber, and things like that, and get a chuck, get a chuck, have a laugh. That's great. You know, you know, and read some, watch some comedy shows or shows. But you want fullness of joy? Hey, the Bible, hey, the clear. You know, you know, you're going to find it. Take find him and get in His presence because it's fullness of joy. Fullness. How many times does God say to, 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 to in the Old Testament, fear not, fear not. Now, he's not saying fear not, and they're not, and they're going, well, hang on, I'm really, really afraid, and he's going, afraid, and I don't care, fear not, stop it, don't do it, don't, you wuss, stop it, stop it, stop it, no, fear. no, no, I said stop, stop. He's not doing that. He says fear, he says, and then he tells them why they shouldn't fear. I'm with you. You're in my presence, man. 
Don't fear. Because you're in my presence. There's fullness of joy. There's lack of fear. I could go on and go on. There's so many things the Bible talks about. Talks we find in the presence of a father, in the presence of our God. Our God. Transformation and change takes place in our life in the presence of God. Not because we think we've read a self help book or we know what step to take and we know how to do this and you know we're praying where's that and now I'm really disciplined here. Or I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of that. But don't ever, don't trade what Jesus died on the cross. The cross that was the access to come back to the Father for the sake of everything else that we think that make us the person we think we should look like. Look like. Trust God. Trust. Be with God. Have grace. Receive His grace, which is actually the transformation from our to change. Interesting in Exodus chapter 34. I was just reading this yesterday. Exodus 34, verse 29. It's speaking of Moses. Moses goes up on the mountain and he gets the you know, the, the Ten Commandments, which must have just to the angels in heaven felt like an absolute joke. God, you gave them one in one garden of Eden, they couldn't even keep that. What are you doing giving them ten? Their track record is not really good with one red one. This is going to be a waste of time. I'm just time now, God. They couldn't obey one red one. Don't eat from the tree. They did it. Now you're giving them ten. Give them you expect. You set yourself up for hurt. But he gave but anyway. And Moses goes up there and he gets there in the Ten Commandments. And here's what it says, says Exodus 34, 29. It says, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the covenant of the two tablets, tablets of the covenant of the law in his hands. So he's got the Ten Commandments in his hands. There it is up there. He was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. It's funny. He's carrying the Ten Commandments down. He hasn't had a chance to do them yet. Do them yet. Hasn't had a chance to be a really, really good Christian yet. Yet. Hasn't had a chance to abase, to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. But he comes but down from the presence of God and he's glowing. Anyone ever spend time in the sun? Sun? Go outside today, take your shirt off, your sh- walk around in your underpants in your backyard. Something's going to happen to you in the presence of the sun. The sun. Amen? You're going to change. Gonna ch- your color's going to change. You're probably going to end up with blisters. Something's going to be different about you from spending presence in the sun. In the presence of the sun. Well, it's no different spending time in the presence of the sun. We are transformed and we are changed. Moses goes there before he even obeys laws. His law, he gets to do anything with the law. He shows he's something. He says, look, the law is great. great. Uh, it, 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 as a matter of fact, it talks about the Talk Testament that the law is like a, 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 a guy that kind of points us to Jesus and so on. So on. Reasons for the law. And yes, we need to yes, we need the law. Please don't interpret and read. Don't read and do whatever you want. It's a free for all. For all. It's not. But what I'm saying is when you get in the presence of God, you don't want to do all those things. Those things. Slowly, the desire that those things begin to disappear, and you don't want to want those things anymore. You're not forcing yourself to do the other things because you're in the presence of God, and He transforms you. You want to start to do that. That not praying because I have to, man. I just want to pray because I've been with Him and Him transforming me and changing my heart, and my changing my desires. And you know what? All of a sudden, all of a sudden, I pray. I want to be with Him. I want to get into His Word. I want to be around be Him because you know something happens when you take time to be around Him. I'm transformed and I'm changed. We're changed around him. It says that when Moses comes down, he was so radiant. And I find this very interesting. What did they have to do to him? him. That they put a veil over his face because everybody else wasn't ready yet. They were transformed by the glory that had transformed him. It's interesting. Fast forward when uh, Jesus dies on the cross. Matthew makes this statement. He statement. And when Jesus died, he breathed his last. This, he says, the temple, the veil was torn in two. The temple curtain. In the temple, there were different sections. In a nutshell, nut, simply put, different sections. And there was a section called the Holy of Holies. And, uh, and the high priest could go in there and, uh, and once or a couple of times a year, and they would tie, they would tend to his feet. Because if he went into there into, and there was uh, unconfessed sin and, and stuff, he could literally die in the presence of God. And they would drag him out by the chunk. By the, nobody could even go in there to get his body. That body. How holy and sacred it was in that, in that where God dwelt. Yet when Jesus died, that stuff was torn apart. And everyone, everyone now have access to the very presence of God. Why do we not go there? Go there. Why are we not go we not there? Why do we not prioritize time in the presence in the of God? Why do we not prioritize? Jesus died. Jesus, the temple veils torn in two, sins with. And now we're ready to be in the presence of God again. We're ready to stand in the presence of God and be transformed by the same glory or glorious that transformed Moses. Moses. And then this in turn allows us to reveal the glory or the goodness of God to the world around us. In the same way that Moses that was with God came out of there and the people around him saw there's something different about you. We go and be with God and we come out of there. The world around us sees there's something different about you. We don't come to church or read our Bible to find another rule, another way. 
We don't come to church or read our Bible to discover another do and another don't. We don't to hear what you need to draw near to and you need to you've got to pull away from and stay away. Stay from. Jesus did it perfectly in John chapter, chapter five, verse thirty-nine to forty, speaking to the speaking to leaders at the time. He said, "You study the studies. These are guys that knew the word of the word inside and out. Some of them had committed the committed five books of the Old Testament to memory. The memory in the synagogue every day. The doors were open. They opened like they were really good Christian people. Christian. He says, "You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal you have life." And then he smacks him in the face and he says, "These are the very scriptures that testify about me. They're not testifying about the do's, don'ts, and rights. They're testifying about a person. They're pointing you point to me." And then he says this, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. He doesn't say you refuse to do what I say. He says you refuse to come to me. Come to me. You don't want to come to me. come to me. You don't want to be with me. You don't want to be in relationship with me. I'm a father, I'm a father taskmaster. And you refuse to come to me. You don't want to be, you don't be with me. Why would you not want to be with a perfect father? I get it. Why get it? I don't want to be with some of the imperfect father, father we've seen uh, in our human existence. But why would we not want to be? Every one of us is one of us. The reason we don't like certain things about things, our, our, our parental authority, authority and, the, and the reason we get disappointed and hurt, and hurt, it's our way of saying there's something wrong with that. That. There's got to be better. And you didn't and add up. You didn't match up. Well, there's a father who does. A father who does and he offers us strained access. And relationship to him. See, life's found in being with Jesus, not doing things for Jesus. But if you make being with Jesus the goal, here's the reality: you'll end up doing things for Jesus, and you probably won't even realize because you're just focused on being with Jesus. Everyone remember Matthew twenty-five, five: sheep and the goats. Blessed are you. Blessed enter into your rest. I was hungry, and you fed me. I was me thirsty. He gave me something to drink. I was, and they looked at him and they said, when did we do that? <laughs> we weren't even trying to be good Christians. We weren't even trying to do all that. We, we, we were just looking at you. We were with you. You. We did all Oh, I, I did, yeah, but we weren't trying to just do things for the task of the task and do things for the one that gave us orders. We were just wanting to be with our father. Our father. And if you want to be a person that wants to be with him, be with what? The overflow of that is, of course, and we, we do do. We do things. We do, things. but we're not doing them to get them to love. We're doing them as a response to a love that we know we have. We're not doing them to get the Father's attention. We're doing them because we know we've already got His attention. Warts and all, baggage and all. He loves us. He loves. We'll finish with this story. Yesterday we were downtown at the the um, uh, Lismore Lismore Heart, the music thing, and it was a great it was a great day. We great down there and heard a few of the band. It was a country. Band, there, anyone like country, like big band. I was thinking of you while you're there. I was sitting there doing my best restraint, restraint country dancing. You know, they were ladies, all ladies didn't care. They were running out in the middle of the streets, doing street ones and everything like that. I'm not quite that free that in that uh, in that space. But we're down there, and then we walked around the corner to check out another out band, and the band was playing us playing. Towards the end of it, somebody let off a little poof thing, and all streamers, little bits of paper poof, everywhere, everywhere. And I watched this little kid, and this little kid, and this was over there. And they all went boof and then landed on the ground. So the little kid walked over there and he started to pick them up. There, there, there were a thousand little pieces of paper that big. But he walked over and he went to pick it up. And then as he got there to grab it, a grab it, the wind came. And they just went <laughs> everywhere. Where? Huh? Now at that point, I'm going, ah, whatever, I'm giving up. But not this little boy. Boy, He starts running after them and instead of grabbing them in the air and on the ground. And he's trying to grab all these bits of paper. And I'm looking at him and, 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 I, and, and I turned to Jackie and I said, mate, he's, he's flogging a dead horse, that kid. That's a, that's a time. There's no way he's going to get all that stuff. And I thought, you know what? I reckon that's what a lot of people, a lot of Christian life is like. We're running around trying to do so many things. Trying to pick up so many things, many things. thinking this pleases this pod, that pleases God, this this how you please God, this please that's how you please God. Drop this and stop that, stop. And we end up throwing our hands in the air and in the air. What's the point? It's so hard. It shouldn't be because Jesus made statements like, "Come to me if you're heavy burden, heavy. My yoke's easy. My burden's light." Sat with a kid in a coffee shop about shop fifteen years ago in Bath. We're chatting and he had some things going on in his world. His world all of a sudden he broke down and started crying. He's a year old kid crying in a coffee shop. I said, What's going on for you going on now? He said, I can't do it anymore. I said anymore. What? 
He said, I'm sick of that. I'm going to please him. I thought he was talking about his dad about his, or teacher, boss. I said, who? He looked at me with tears in his eyes and he said, God, God, I'm sick of trying to please him. I'm sick of feeling like, What's the worst thing I've got to do? What's the next performance thing I have to do in order for him to actually to actually love me? Because yeah, you can say it. Say it. Deep down inside, a lot of us still feel like we still like to do something more to get him to like us, to like to love us. And I actually said to him, to him which I thought, by the way, was a great bit of wisdom at the time. I said to him, you know what? You're probably at the perfect place now for the first time to just stop trying. You're probably at the place that God wants you to be. Stop trying. Stop trying. He's not your father because you've proven yourself worse as a son. He's your father because he chooses you, your father. And he chooses to call you son and daughter. Daughter. He's a father. Father. Who is God to you? Is he a divine taskmaster with a list of do's and don'ts and rules? And rules? Are you still trying to please? Please try to hear. What's the next instruction? What's the next order, God? Or is he your father? Father. Who speaks to you? We're trying to get trying to see and do. And God wants us to just be still and know. See, the church is not meant to be a public organization working for a great progress. It's a family of children enjoying great intimacy with their with. Them. That's who we should do. And we can't ever afford to fall out of that. I just want us to bow our heads for a second. Lord, I just want to thank you just want to for your word, God. I want to thank you this morning, this God. And, and I, I, still, I still feel like I feel there are some people here, and, and God, this is, this is prophetic for a couple of people in this room here. You're on that trail now. You are still in your brain. You know all the verses and all the Christianese and all the stuff, but in your heart, your, you are still struggling. Still struggling to accept that he's your father. He's, he's more like more boss. Or, or your taskmaster, or, or the, 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 the relationship of, of a child, clumsiness of that relationship, the goodness at times of that relationship, the imperfection of the child in the presence of the father. You, you struggle to accept that. Except the God wants to say to you this morning that he loves you because he chooses to. Not because you earned it, weren't because you worked for it, but because he made a choice. He made a choice. Accept it. Accept it. So, Father, I just pray just for each of us in this room, Lord, that that Holy Spirit, if you've been if you've been to us, God, I pray we would not get up from this from this and just walk away and get on with life, get off and eat our chicken sandwiches for lunch, for forget the very words, the very life that you're speaking to us, God. You speak for a reason, God. I pray that uh, Lord, you would prompt prompt one here that's hearing from you, Lord, prompt them, prompt, go and speak to somebody. To share with somebody this morning, to pray with somebody, with God, to put some sort of fertilizer, fertilize that seed, so that seed grows into something really, really strong in their heart and in their life today, Father, Father. And Lord, for each uh, rest of God, as we leave this place, I pray in this for seven days. God, we are going to come across people who have no idea, idea that there's a God in heaven who loves them. We're going to come across people who have no idea, idea that the sins that they are living in bonding into have already been dealt with two thousand years ago on the cross. So, Father, give us a chance to talk to some talk to people in the next seven days. Give us the opportunity, Lord, to come across their path and path tell them they have value, they have worth, have worth, and that, God, you love them and you're calling to them, Father. And we ask this ask in Jesus' name. Everybody this morning said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, can I encourage you, please, if, you, if God's speaking to you, you don't have to come up to come. We're not a church where we only lead us to lead. Pray. Please grab somebody. If you want to come, if you want to be happy to chat with you and pray with you, Grab somebody, talk to somebody, share somebody. You feel like the Spirit's saying to you, and pray for one another. Let's minister to one another. That's what the church is. That's what the body is meant to do. It ministers to one another. So, so don't throw away the opportunity to do that. Amen? Amen? Okay.